then let's get going. So hi, everyone. Welcome to lecture three, our final lecture, where I'm going to be talking about mostly applications of quantum computing to HEP, but there's also going to be a piece um, about um, quantum machine learning, because that's actually one of the ways in which people are really applying it um, to, to HEP. So yep, that's just a reminder where we are. We started with lecture one in terms of fundamentals. Yesterday, we talked about quantum computers and quantum algorithms. And now we're really trying to bring it together to kind of answer the question, how, ma how might all of this actually be useful um, to us? So last time um, we covered a lot. Um, we went through some of the different quantum computers that are being used today. Um, we discussed some of the important um, quantum algorithms, brief introduction to how you might go about quant programming on a quantum computer, talked a lot about quantum advantage and also talked about the importance of quantum error correction. Now, as everyone knows, um, computing plays really a vital role in our successful exploitation of physics results from the LHC. We use computing extensively, places from detector control, through detector simulation, to reconstruction and analysis. Also, in high energy physics, we have this long tradition of being at the forefront of new computing technologies. And of course, it's not just computing technologies, it's many other things too, and even inventing them in certain cases. Of course, one of our most notable exa um, examples is the World Wide Web. There's also the grid. And so I think it's for those two reasons that it's particularly timely to ask the question, can quantum computing be useful for HEP? And I'm not sure I'm going to give you the answer today. That's not really my goal. But instead, what I'm trying to do is to provide you with um, some examples of things that various different people are trying out um, so that you can start thinking about this question and, and, and come up to some sort of um, answer for yourself. One big comment before I get into the details. Um, as you've seen, um, quantum computers are really evolving very rapidly. Um, however, we don't yet know if and when they might be useful. So I don't think that the goal right now is to necessarily define a quantum algorithm that's going to be useful today for HEP. It's more thinking about how might they be useful and doing experiments by developing algorithms to try and work in that direction. I also think that developing algorithms now, even in this NISC era, can really help to steer the design of quantum computers. So basically, just to say sort of one sentence, I don't think it matters right now whether the algorithms are useful or not. That's not the purpose of, it, of many of these um, studies. So here's the outline for today. Of course, we're gonna be talking about these applications um, and they're going to fall into three different categories. First one is simulation. A couple of examples there, are gonna talk about parton shower correlations and um, some examples from Lattice QCD. Then reconstruction, there's actually been a number of different projects and at the moment they all seem to be focused on particle tracking. So I'll give you a number of different examples there so you can see the range. And then in analysis, there have been a range of different Higgs analyses, also a Su SUSE search. Now, as you'll see, um, most of this is all very new, been done in the last year or two, um, and progress has really been very rapid. And so in this talk, I'm going to be relying on a mix of published and unpublished results. And I do want to apologize for anyone's work I might have left out or anyone's work that I might not do full justice to. Um, any mistake is, of course, um, my own. So let's move on to simulation. Um, here's a sort of classic picture that we've all seen many times. And the question that the study I'm going to present here was asking is when we simulate the parton shower, what we do right now is we assume that each of those little showering interactions is independent um, to do it. Of course, we know that that's actually not true, right? We have quantum particles, obviously there can be interactions between them. And so the idea that um, these authors had was to really exploit entanglement between qubits on a quantum computer to really properly simulate these correlations in the parton shower. And there was a paper uh, two years ago now, um, which went through this toy model where you can see the Lagrangian here. And the idea is you introduce this co um, constant G12, which actually allows you to study some of these very interesting effects um, to see it. So you can have, for example, these different real emission amplitudes to give rise to interference. You can also have these virtual diagrams, which give rise to flavor changes um, without radiation. 
And so what they did is they really implemented the quantum algorithm. So here you can see the quantum circuit um, for the final state radi radiation algorithm. And it's actually just one of the end steps. And then if you look at the bottom right here, this is a plot showing the differential cross section as a function of the largest emission angle. So it's really looking at the angle of these emissions within the parton shower. Um, it's using IBM Q, and I think it was a quantum computer with four qubits um, that the study was done. And what you want to do here is you want to compare blue to red. That's when you have the interference off in blue and on in red. And so you can notice that this actually modifies the shape of the distribution. Then you also want to compare um, the sort of the histogram to the points. The histogram is what you get in the simulation, and then the points are what you get in the data. And of course, you can also compare it to the analytical calculation, which is um, for G equals zero, which is this black um, line. And what you notice is that indeed there is a difference. So there is an effect here that one could think about simulating. And when the radiation is off, there's actually good agreement between the um, hardware and the simulation. But once you switch it on, it's not necessarily quite as good. And that's actually expected because one needs to worry about things like the noise, um, for example. But this is a very nice um, study. Then moving on to lattice QCD. Um, this is, of course, one of our examples of very computationally heavy um, calculations that we need to do. And of course, here we're simulating a highly complex um, quantum theory, so it's quite natural to think could we do this better on a quantum computer? And indeed, there are a number of people thinking in this direction. I've just pulled out two papers here to give you some idea about it. It's, of course, not full lattice QCD yet, but some pieces. There's one from the group um, launched at the University of Washington, where they looked into doing these, um, doing a quantum classical, so it's a hybrid algorithm, um, of uh, Schwinger model dynamics. So it's a somewhat simplified uh, model using quantum computers. And that's actually a plot on the right, which is showing you some of the results that they have, where you can compare the results on IBM Q, which are the points, to the analytic calculation. You can see that that's actually doing really quite well. Then the paper at the bottom, um, which is a, a group from a range of universities, they were actually looking into doing one piece of the lattice um, field calculation. And this is um, using this interpolator optimization on a quantum computer um, to do it. And so I don't think we're there yet. Oops, I just changed slides. Um, but I think that we're at a really interesting stage where one can actually think about it. Notably, um, in both cases here, once they're using quantum classical hybrid algorithms, which was something we were discussing a bit yesterday. And indeed, it may be that these are the types of algorithms that are really quite um, common, particularly in early applications of quantum computing to have. Now, moving on to reconstruction, um, where I'm going to show you some examples about tracking. In fact, I'm going to show you a number of different examples because this has been a pretty active area. There have been two different studies of quantum annealing. There has been a study of quantum associative memory, a quantum half transform, and a quantum graph neural network. And these were all the ones I managed to find. Perhaps there are more that I don't um, necessarily know about. So why tracking? Um, this is a plot uh, from Atlas, which is just showing you how much CPU time you would use per event as a function of mu, which is the number of additional interactions. And you can see here um, the points, which are showing kind of where we are right now. Then the arrows, and also the point I've added way out here, is kind of where we're going to be at the high luminosity LHC if we do absolutely nothing compared to what we have right now. And so what we know is that we expect that track reconstruction is going to have a very large CPU burden at the high luminosity LHC. And of course, you know, many discussions are ongoing at the moment thinking what might we do in the future? What future collider might we build? Um, it's very likely it's going to be even worse um, there. And so that means it's a natural problem. Let's take one of our hard, very computation intense problems and let's see what we could be able to do with a quantum computer. Now, pretty much all the studies um, presented here are using something called the TrackML dataset, which is a dataset that we produced um, to try and encourage machine learning studies of tracking algorithms. But it's turned into a dataset that can be used for very, um, very commonly for algorithmic development. Um, so you can follow the link if you want to find some details about what that dataset is. 
And of course, given the current limitations of, of um, quantum computers, many of these studies will either restrict the multiplicity, so they won't quite get to this high luminosity LHC regime, or they'll focus, for example, on the central region, or they'll focus on high PT tracks um, to do it. Um, and then there's also quite a lot of slicing where you actually divide the data geometrically. And these are just ways in which to mitigate the limitations in terms of the power of current um, quantum computers. So the first study I'm going to show you is um, using these quantum annealers. So for example, um, D-Wave. And what we did here is we reformulated track reconstruction as an energy minimization problem, which allowed us to solve it using the D-Wave quantum annealer. The reason why this is interesting to think about is that if you can have just one minimization problem for your full tracking problem compared to other local tracking algorithms, you have the potential to have a solution time which does not scale with the number of tracks. Um, so that means you can don't really care so much about the luminosity. You can go super high, and the time that you're going to spend tracking would be the, would be similar. So that's interesting to think about. More technically, the way that this was done was to implement a cubo minimization of D-Wave, and then we studied the scaling with the track multiplicity. It's actually inspired by some pretty old paper, which is by Stimple, Abelie, and Garado, which was looking into fast track finding um, with neural networks, but with some changes. For example, in this study, what we did is we used triplets, so you know three sets of three hits, um, as the qubits to do it. So once you do that, you kind of put these um, triplets as the qubits, and then you can encode the quality of those triplets based on physics properties. For example, you can think about doing pairwise connections um, as constraints or as incentives. And that's what the sketch here is trying to show you a little bit. For example, you can think, you know, do you actually share hits or do you see a kink in it? Or do you actually have conflicts between them? And you can set up the various different terms for your cubo according to those. And then you're going to minimize O, which will really be selecting the best triplets in order to um, form track candidates. Um, and then there's the paper that we published about this um, link at the bottom there. Then here shows you a little bit more detail about the implementation. There's kind of an algorithmic flow chart here um, to do it again, using the TrackML data set, focusing on the barrel with tracks above one GV and at least five hits. And it is indeed, a, in some sense, a hybrid classical quantum algorithm because there are a number of steps of pre-processing, which you can see here, which is really getting those triplets um, set up and building the cubo. Then you solve the cubo on D-Wave, and then you do some post-processing to get the final track. And then, of course, you do some studies and scoring to really see um, how well you've done with the algorithm. We tried out a number of different cubo solvers. Um, we used QBSol, which is something provided by D-Wave. We ran that on both D-Wave and in simulation. There's also an alternative NEIL, um, which actually runs only in simulation. It was run on uh, three different computers, two quantum, um, one not. The two quantum were two of the different D-Waves. And then also, which I'll come back to a little bit later, um, on Fujitsu, um, a Fujitsu digital annealer. So this is a specialized hardware designed to do quantum, sorry, not quantum, designed to do annealing, but it is not a quantum computer um, to, to do it. But it's still very interesting to compare the performance. And on the right, this is a little sketch showing you kind of how the performance um, can look um, for just you know one of the events where you had 2,000 particles and 16,000 hits. You want to look at the green, which are the ones that are real and reconstructed. And then you can see the blue, the ones were missed. And for example, you can see the red ones, those would be fake tracks um, that were fined. So here are the initial performance that was obtained um, using D-Wave. And this is looking as a function of the number of particles in each event. So you can think that where we are today at the high luminosity LHC, we're somewhere low here on the curve. High luminosity LHC is actually a little bit off the right um, of this curve. And there's three different numbers shown here. There's this track and all score. That was something used in that track and all challenge to compare the algorithms. It's sort of meant to be a mix of the efficiency and the purity. And then we have um, the precision and the recall, which loosely map to the fake rate and to the efficiency um, to do it. And then the two plots are showing you um, what it looks like if you're just running in simulation um, with QBSol, so on a classical computer. The bottom plot shows you how it looks if you run on D-Wave um, to do it. A couple of things to note. 
The um, recall, which is the efficiency, this stays really good. Uh, I mean, it stays very, the performance is very good, even up to high multiplicity. But indeed, the precision starts to drop quite dramatically. And what that's showing us is that as you get to high multiplicity, there can be a number of different fakes. The other thing to notice is that the performance is essentially the same in simulation and on the hardware, which is actually showing us that we are not significantly impacted by noise on the quantum computer um, to see it. Now, of course, we always talk about timing for quantum computers. So you might ask, how does this do? Uh, we don't have a great answer to that. Um, unfortunately, at the time when we did the study, it was very difficult to actually get the detailed timing breakdown from within D-Wave because the way it works is you submit your jobs to the queue and then you have to wait, but it's hard to disentangle the time you spent waiting in the queue from the time you spent running on the hardware. Nonetheless, um, here are the numbers that we have where you can see that it really takes a long time um, to be actually able to um, run on D-Wave and we know that there's really important um, overhead. So it'd be interesting to know in more detail how this timing um, actually looks. Subsequently, there was some further work done, which was to improve the purity of the algorithm and to extend it up to high luminosity LHC multiplicities. And that's what you can see here on the plot on the right. It's showing you both the purity and the efficiency. Um, so we flipped our definitions, of, um, of course, um, to do it. And it's showing you both for NEIL and for QBSolve. Um, which are two, the two different um, software that you can actually use for performing the same algorithm. The reason why that's actually interesting to see is that we learned that there were issues in QBSol, which we had to discuss um, with the D-Wave authors. And we understand, and you can even see from this plot, that some of this actually limited the performance. And of course, Neil only runs in simulation, so it was not possible to run that on D-Wave. Then the second part of the study, um, was seeing how this would actually do on that Fujitsu digital annealer. And here you can see the plot, I mean, the table at the bottom right. And on the column, what you want to look at is this density. That's just simply the fraction of track multiplicity compared to high luminosity LHC. And then you can compare what happens, for example, to the CPU time, to the annealing time, and also um, to, uh, on anneal. And what you can notice, which is really interesting, is that for the digital annealer, it's essentially independent of the number of tracks um, to do it. And of course, if you compare the raw numbers to what I was showing you before, even if we talk about overhead, it's really clear that this digital annealer has far superior performance um, to D-Wave. This is actually not a surprise, um, by the way. And one of the things that often gets raised is to whether we might expect any improvement from using these quantum annealers. Um, but it's already clear here that digital annealers are pretty powerful machines um, to use. Here is a second implementation by an independent um, group, um, also doing quantum annealing using Hopfield networks for tracking. Um, and you can see the paper here. Um, and you can see on the top right, they actually used the KDE to estimate the connection probability between a pair of gits. And so this is a plot actually showing you how they would do that calculation. And then on the bottom, they have two plots where they show you the efficiency. Um, and it's one minus the purity in this case. And there are three curves shown. The random, which is the one in green. Then you can see the um, quantum annealing. And then you can actually see, um, I think it's standalone annealing, which is labeled as SA. And here you can see the performance is pretty similar between the two. Um, and of course, far better than random. Uh, this shows you that we do actually need tracking algorithms that they actually do really change something that we do. So moving on to a different topic, one of the things we've talked about that is interesting for quantum computers is there's this real potential for exponential um, memory storage. And so the idea here was based on, was inspired by ideas for hardware-based track triggers. For example, something like um, the FTK, which Atlas um, was studying. And you could do something similar with a quantum computer by actually developing quantum associated memory. The plot here on the bottom right shows you why you would want to do that. What it actually shows you, and it's sort of maybe backwards from how you might expect it. On the y axis, this is the number of bits that you have. And then on the x axis, this is really how much memory you will actually get. And what you can notice is that if you have regular associative memory, 
you start running out of memory um, very quickly. I mean, it starts, you don't get very much more as you increase the number of bits. Whereas if you can use quantum associative memory, on the other hand, you have this huge amount of memory available. And note that this y, this y axis is actually on a log scale. So it really is a dramatic increase. And this just shows how powerful such, um, such an algorithm could actually be. Now, the implementation um, that was done was using making quantum associative memory circuit generators, which were implemented, um, implementing the Trugenberger's initialization and using that generalization of Grover's algorithm, which we were talking about yesterday. And this was using that um, open source platform, Qiskit, um, from IBM. So the quantum computers that were used were um, some of these IBM cloud based um, chips with five, 14, or 20 um, qubits and also using local or remote noisy simulators. The pictures that I'm showing here, are actually showing you a snippet of how the code actually looks, and then examples for the um, complete circuit for encoding and for retrieving a two qubit um, pattern. If you're interested in seeing more details um, of the study, there is a paper that is actually linked there um, where you could find out um, more details. Oh, I've lost a picture here. Ah, here, yeah. okay. Um, <laughs> so something that's um, still a work in progress um, is looking at how we might actually do a different type of tracking algorithm, which is a Hopf transform um, on a quantum computer. Hopf transforms are kind of neat. You basically do a coordinate transformation into a different space, and then you're actually very able to transform your track finding problem into one of finding minimum maxima in that space. And so that means that it's kind of a natural algorithm to think about doing on a quantum computer because we could actually exploit some of those algorithms that we've been talking about, which would really be quite powerful. Um, there is the breakdown of the algorithm. And so it has a number of steps of classical processing. Then it has this um, subroutine that's actually run in the quantum computer, which is essentially a maxima finder based on Grover Long. And then there is a measurement extraction, and then you map back to find the reconstructed um, tracks based on some ideas which were performed in um, that paper. And here you can actually see one of the plots. Um, I think this is an accumulator space for an event with just eight tracks, um, where you can actually map here into the vote counts, where you can actually look to find the maxima, and you can do that using the Grover Long algorithm. So it's still a work in progress. But it's very interesting because it actually could be a way that we might be able to do um, track finding on um, universal quantum um, computers. Now, here we come our first mention of machine learning, and there's going to be a bunch more in the rest of the talk. Um, graph neural networks for particle tracking are something that has been explored for a number of years in the HEPTRACX and then the ExatrackX collaboration. And so there was a recent study about whether one could actually extend this and apply a quantum graph neural network to particle tracking um, to do it. Again, here, this is going to is a hybrid quantum classical algorithm. And what they do is they encode the hit coordinates as angles, and then they iteratively apply a quantum edge and node network. So that's what the sketch at the bottom um, of the slide is actually showing. So you have this inroad network, you apply an edge network, and you apply a node network, apply an edge network again, a node network again, and basically keep going um, through. And what that allows you to do is to really propagate the information that you have to all the different um, detector layers. And then finally, you apply this edge network and use that to classify the segments. There are a couple of papers um, you can have a look at, and there's also a recording of a nice talk that was given at Connecting the Dots um, last year. Um, as far as I can tell, it still hasn't been run on, it hasn't been run on quantum hardware yet. I may be wrong about that, but that was my understanding. But in simulation, um, it obtains um, an AOC of about 0.8. Um, but something interesting that the authors noted is that the performance seems to decrease as the number of iterations increases, which is not what you'd expect. In fact, you'd expect quite the opposite. Their understanding of this, um, which you can see in the plot, right? You can see with one that's in yellow, and then two is in blue, and red is in three, is that this is due to the limited statistics that can be used. This is again back to limitations of what the size of the quantum computers, 
And also they're limited in how complex a network they can actually um, use for the problem. Um, nonetheless, it's very interesting and might be a potential route but <coughs> towards using machine learning um, for doing track reconstruction on quantum computers. Now let me move on to analysis. And I would say this one is entirely machine learning on quantum computers. And there have actually already been a number of different studies. Um, what I'm going to show you today are three different Higgs searches um, and also one supersymmetry search that different groups of authors have um, performed. Now, quantum machine learning is, of course, lying at the intersection between both quantum computing and machine learning, which are both fields which are really undergoing this rapid development cycle. So, of course, it's an extremely exciting topic. Um, and usually when we talk about quantum machine learning, we're actually talking about using quantum computers to analyze data that we produce classically, right? We're not talking about sort of running everything that we would actually have um, directly on the quantum computer. Instead, what we would have is we would produce a data set, and then you would use a quantum, a quantum computer to um, run machine learning algorithms on that data set. Similar to what I was showing you for tracking, in many cases, the most promising, promising methods are these hybrid classical quantum approaches. And both quantum annealers and digital computers have been explored. In case you're interested, I added a couple of links. There's one to a, an introductory quantum machine learning textbook. There's also recently a very nice review article about quantum machine learning and HEP. And so I refer you to those references in case you're interested in seeing some more information. And here I'm not trying to provide an overview. I'm especially not an overview of quantum machine learning, which is an enormous field, rather trying to show examples of studies that have been performed. But of course, I should um, add a warning, and this comes from one of the experts. In fact, he's one of, he, I think he wrote that quantum machine learning textbook that I've linked, saying, don't fall for the hype. Um, because, of course, if you have these two fields that are super exciting, people can get very excited about um, quantum machine learning. And indeed, we don't yet have any theoretical proofs that it will necessarily be better on quantum computers than they are on classical computers. But again, we don't know. So the first example that I'm going to um, discuss is using um, quantum adiabatic machine learning. And this is a search um, using the CMS, Higgs to gamma gamma analysis. Um, which was performed using B-Wave. There's a sketch here, which is showing you how quantum adiabatic machine learning um, can work. Oh, and by the way, just some credit. I, I, on these in the next couple of slides, there are um, some ones that I, I got from Jean-Roch Vimont uh, um, from a very nice talk that he gave. So you do, what you do is you um, set up the system with a trivial Hamiltonian and a ground state. Um, and so that would be this H naught, which is in blue. And then you want to ev adiabatically evolve that Hamiltonian towards the desired um, Hamiltonian. And the idea is that if you can actually, you can use the adiabatic theorem, if you evolve the system slowly, then you can actually remain in this ground state. And the idea is a very nice paper by Pudence and all, which shows the ideas behind this, which is that you want to use this to first in the training, identify a set of weak classifiers, and then you want to identify the optimal set to form the strong classifier. Then in the testing, you actually want to evolve those strong classifiers to identify anomalous elements. So essentially what that means is you're not trying to start out by finding the best way to discriminate between signal and background. All you're actually trying to do is find a set of classifiers that provide some discrimination, and then you can actually use this quantum adiabatic machine learning to actually evolve it into the strong classifier that you can um, use. So that was what was done here. So the top left, this shows how the classifier was defined. So you find these set of functions, h, such that you know you had um, the probability of the signal if h was greater than zero, greater than the probability of the background, and then vice versa um, if um, h was less than zero. So the goal here, of course, is you're just trying to say, if um, most of the signal is going to be for h greater than zero, most of the background less than um, for h less than zero. Then you want to combine these by defining this weight w, which is going to be this binary linear combination of h1. And you can actually combine them simply by summing them all up with the appropriate weights um, into your objective function, which is going to be O. 
Then on the right, there's some more details about how you would actually define this objective function um, to do it with the defining the target function, including the per event error, and getting to the full error um, to do it. And then when you notice here that we have an objective function, you might think back to some of the discussion we've had about cubos. It's actually pretty straightforward to actually transform this into something that could actually be run um, directly on a quantum annealer. So what they did is they had a data set of 300 signal, 300K, sorry, 300K signal, 300K background events. And they defined training subsets, which ranged from 100 to 20,000 events. And then, of course, had separate testing sets uh, for signal and background. And had a set of key discriminating variables. It's the ones you would expect, things like photon momentum and variant mass, which can be combined in various different um, ways. On the bottom left, some details about how the weak classifier function is defined. Um, and then on the right is actually talking about how they went about doing this training um, and really scanning on the different excited states that were included in the classifier. The results of this were published in Nature. Um, and you can see on the bottom left, oh, I'm missing a label, sorry about that, um, which is really showing you the signal efficiency as a function of the background projection. The ones you want to look at is, of course, QA. This is going to be the quantum annealer. And then you want to compare it to um, the classical annealer in SA, and then to, to two state-of-the-art machine learning, classical machine learning techniques, deep neural network and using H XG boost um, to do it. Um, so to first order, it looks, um, there's a slight improvement with annealing, but it looks pretty similar um, given the bands of the uncertainties. But then what's quite interesting, and this is something we'll come up with a little bit later in some of the other studies, is that if you look at the function of the size of the training data set, what you can notice is that the quantum annealer seems to perhaps get um, to the good performance a bit earlier, even if it doesn't obtain necessarily the ultimate performance as you move on to a, high, a, higher, a lot, higher statistics data set. There was a recent extension to these results, um, adding in quantum um, machine learning with zooming. And the idea here <coughs> is that you want to um, iteratively perform it to obtain the weight on the weak um, classifiers to actually make them be continuous instead of discrete. And so effectively, it's a binary search over the energy surface using the spin up and spin down outcomes. And there's a sketch on the bottom left here, which is trying to illustrate how this can happen, where you start out um, with your weights and how they might actually shift around as you repeat um, the performance. <coughs> Sorry, repeat the algorithm. Then on the right, these are um, some of the results that they found um, using Higgs gamma gamma and D-Wave 2X. Um, you wanna have a look at all the different curves, right? And so some of them look the same. And then you can see how this actually improves when you run um, QAML with zooming, and that's the Z that you have, which was also applied to the other um, techniques. And so what you can notice on the bottom is here is a direct comparison to what you get um, in the simulation. And you can notice that if you add in zooming, you do actually get an improvement compared to the simulation. So that's very interesting uh, to see. So now I'd like to move on to um, a set of three studies, which were done by Salam Wu and the Wisconsin group. Again, I'm showing her slides here. Um, and they focused on um, exploring quantum machine learning for the TTH Higgs to gamma gamma and the Higgs to mu mu analysis. And they've tried out three different methods, which is very nice because we can actually look at them and we can really compare the results. The first one is variational quantum classifier method. Second one is the quantum support vector machine kernel method. The third one is the quantum neural network method. Of course, given the limitations of quantum computers today, in many cases, they were using something like 100 events and 10 variables. So the first method is the variational quantum classifier, or VQC. And what is done, you can also look at the picture here, which um, summarizes the algorithm quite nicely, um, is that you first start by applying the feature map um, which is you, which will encode your data into the quantum state. Then you want to apply the short depth quantum variational circuit, and that's W of theta, 
um, and it is parameterized in terms of the gate angles um, theta. Once you've done that, you want to measure the qubit state in the standard basis and assign a label for the event, whether it's signal or background, through the action of a diagonal operator F in the standard basis. Now, when this is done, during the training phase, a set of events are used to train the circuit W of theta. And the idea of this is to be able to reproduce the correct classification. And then using this optimized W of theta, an independent set of events are used for the evaluation and testing. Um, there's some references here. You can see the full talk by Salad. And then there's also the reference um, to the paper um, where more details are presented. Here are the results. Um, on the left, I'm showing you TTH. On the right, um, Higgs to Mu Mu. And at the top, there is a comparison between what you can actually get um, on the quantum simulator compared to other classical methods, for example, a classical support vector machine or a BDT. And you actually see here that for both TTH and for um, Higgs to Mu Mu, there really is quite similar performance to classical um, methods. On the bottom, you can actually see how it compares for both TTH and Higgs to Mu Mu for uh, IBM quantum simulator and then also for IBM quantum hardware. And again, here you see actually quite good agreement between the simulation and the, and the hardware. The second method that they tried out is the quantum SVM kernel method. And what this does is this actually maps classical data, um, again, labeled as X, into a quantum state um, phi using a quantum feature map function. Then once you've done that, you want to calculate the similarity between any two data events, i.e. the kernel entry. And this is going to be k, um, which is the inner product of the two functions of phi. And this piece is actually what is done on a quantum uh, computer. And once you have the kernel entries, you want to actually find a separating hyperplane that will actually allow you to separate the signal from the background. And these are results really hot off the press. There's a publication that I understand will be coming soon. Um, and in general, what they see here is that there is actually improved performance over the classical methods. And there is good agreement between the simulation and the hardware. And you can see this, for example, if you look at the plots, um, they run on a number of different quantum computers. Um, in particular, here at the top, you can see what happens when you're running on 15 qubits um, with 20,000 20, events. And you can compare this QSVM kernel on Google um, to a classical support vector machine and also a classical um, BDT. And so here, it, um, it looks quite similar. But then if you look on the right, you can actually have a look as a function of this area under the curve as a function of the number of qubits. At the top, you're comparing, for example, the Google machine to the classical ones. And here you notice that there is indeed a small improvement. And at the bottom, there is actually a comparison between very different quantum computers, which is interesting. So comparing Google to IBM to um, Amazon. But as I mentioned, you can actually see the impact from noise. That's the plot on the bottom left, where you want to notice that the simulation actually has a better AUC. Once you actually run the hardware, there is actually some impact. And so here we, we are seeing um, what happens with the noise. So I think that will be a very interesting publication um, when it's coming out. Then the third method that they looked at uh, was a hybrid quantum neural network or QNN. And the way that this is developed, it has um, three different layers. In the classical layer, you want to transform the input data so that the um, number of output will actually match the number of qubits. Um, and so this removes PPA, which is used in many of the other studies. Then the quantum layer will actually encode this data in a quantum state and apply a variational circuit with some trainable parameters and measure the quantum state. And then back to the classical layer, you can convert the measurements of the qubits to classification labels. And what they're doing here is they train the three layers together in order to maximize the overall performance. Here are the results um, from this QNN. Um, again, here, yeah, this is on the TTH. And what you can see is that it's slightly worse on the IBM hardware than the simulation. And however, in simulation, which are the plots at the bottom, you can notice that the QNN has slightly better performance than the DNN, which is again, interesting. 
on this slide, um, there's actually a comparison between these different ML methods um, that have been run. And I kind of added in an extra number compared to the table based on these um, new results. What's interesting is that in most cases, the performance already exceeds the reference classical algorithm. And there is indeed significant variance between the different ML approaches. So far, it seems that the best performance is actually obtained using QNN and Google Simulator. I need to update that. So I think they've actually run that one now with 20 um, qubits. Then the final study I want to show you um, was one which was doing quantum machine learning for SUSY studies. Um, in this paper, which you can see linked at the bottom here, two different approaches were followed. One was using the variational quantum circuits, same method um, used by Wu et al. And they also used something called quantum circuit learning. The links are there in case you want to have a look at the papers. What the idea of the quantum circuit learning is that it is a classical quantum hybrid for low depth um, circuit learning. You want to input the data and iteratively tune the circuit parameters in order to obtain the desired output. And then you would output the calculation from the quantum computer and do some parameter tuning on the classical um, computer. On the right, you can actually see the circuit diagrams for the VQC and for the QCL. And the study that was done was a search for Chargino pair production by a Higgs boson, which are produced by a Higgs boson, using a SUSY data set from the UCI machine learning repository. The final state that they're looking at is two leptons plus MET. They're using a range of 100 to 10K of M and between three to seven different uh, variables. On this slide, um, you can see the results. Um, so here they're using two different 20 qubit IBM quantum computers and the IBM QLAX um, simulator. Um, and so you can see on the left, um, there are the VQC results. And you want to actually have a look at the true positive rate as a function of the false positive rate. And you can actually compare um, the testing versus the training. So this is a good way to check if there's any overtraining. Um, and you want to compare the green to the orange, which is actually running in the simulator versus running on the hardware um, to do it. And you can notice that it looks like there may be some overtraining going on here, which is not particularly surprising given the size um, of the set. On the right, you can see the QCL results as a number of um, events. And there are actually a whole lot of curves um, plotted here, which is very interesting. You can actually see what happens as you increase the number of variables, either classically or quantumly. The ones you want to focus on are indeed the green, which is the QCL. And you can notice that except a very small number of events, again here we're seeing similar to the Higgs to gamma gamma analysis, seems to get up to good performance earlier, but then doesn't necessarily reach the same performance as the classical algorithms. On the bottom, these are the VQC results. And here you want to compare again in green, the QCL quantum algorithm to the orange classical algorithm. And here the performance is pretty similar, except in this low region, where again, it seems that the, on the quantum computer, you get to better performance earlier. So that's something interesting. We don't necessarily know um, how universally true it is, but indeed it's something that seems to be getting observed in a number of different studies. On this slide, I wanted just to put a list of some of the others that I came across that unfortunately I didn't have time to talk about um, today. There are a number of interesting ones. For example, you can think, can we actually optimize the gates for scientific applications? And there's a recent paper you can look at there. Um, there is a paper also talking about how to simulate collider physics on quantum computers, how to maybe do vertexing with quantum annealers, also using quantum annealers to cluster jets or to perform unfolding. And then finally, there's one about how we might actually use unfolding, te unfolding techniques, which are commonly used in particle physics, and these might actually be used to mitigate readout errors. And probably there are more that I don't actually know about yet, um, by no means is that meant to be complete. So that brings me to the end um, of this lecture and also of this um, academic training series. And I hope I've managed to convince you that quantum computing is an exciting field currently going through a rapid development cycle. Major players include a wide range of tech companies and governments around the world. A wide range of technologies are being explored, including superconducting, trapped ion, photonic, silicon, and topological qubits. 
And people are really excited about this because quantum computers may be able to do things that classical computers cannot. And quantum computers may also be able to solve certain problems far more quickly. We also talked um, yesterday about the recent success, which was really this demonstration of quantum um, advantage. However, currently available quantum computers have limited number of qubits, short coherence times, and are very noisy. So that if you're really trying to apply them to real world problems, you need to scale those problems, need to be scaled, not solved, to be able to, um, to really explore the power of quantum computers. Projections really vary widely, uh, wildly about when we might expect, if ever, to have a quantum computer of a size to be more generally useful. At the same time, in high energy physics, we're becoming increasingly constrained by computing resources. We have increasing data set sizes, increasing complexity. We're also trying to do you know, more complex things based on our data, which is great. <coughs> and this becomes even more true when we're thinking about planning future colliders. We also have a long history of being trailblazers in many areas, including computing. And I hope I've shown you today some of the many interesting studies that have been and continue to be performed. And I think that it's important that we can actually do these now to help to determine how quantum computers might be useful for us. And they may also help to provide difficult problems for people designing quantum computers, which might actually result in quantum computers more useful to us. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Heather. So yes, I can see a raised hand from Julian. Yeah, dear Heather, uh, thanks a lot again for this this one. Maybe I should switch in the camera. So that you can yes, see. it's nice to see people. So exactly. I'm not just talking to little black boxes. Yeah, um, I actually have two questions, um, which which are linked actually some, in some sense. Um, they refer to slides 33 and 34 or around. Essentially, um, the example you took was uh, the Higgs search. Sorry, um, just give me one second. Hold on. <laughs> I'm just trying to get my slides back. I'm struggling. Uh, hold on. <laughs> there we go. Um, so which, because there are a couple of Higgs searches. This one. Yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, the first one, well, has nothing to do with the plot in itself. It's um, because you mentioned the, the, the timing for the previous studies a bit earlier. And I was wondering if the timing has been estimated there, uh, because even if they show similar performances, maybe the simulation of the quantum computer could be faster, which would be already in itself a slight advantage. Of course, I understand that timing is hard because of the problem the, with the queuing system, and we have no control over that. But I'm wondering if this has been um, a thought about or tr try to be estimated in some sense? So I don't recall if there were detailed timing studies in this paper or not. We should have a look. Um, but in case any of the authors happen to be connected, they're also welcome to answer if I'm mistaken about that. I imagine those might still be coming. Well. Okay, we will have to follow up on that one. But it's uh, a great question, Julian, and you're right. It's not only about getting better performance. Even if we got exactly the same performance and we could be a lot faster, that would be really interesting. That would be great for the high Lumia LHC, that's for sure. And yeah. the second question is, um, there were results presented with 5, 10, and 20 qubits. Um, but all of them were like the same algorithm ran at 5, 10, or 20 qubits. Now, the question I'm, it's, it's not, uh, I think it was not done, but it, maybe it's it's just something which popped out of my mind. Um, would it be possible to mitigate the uh, passage from simulation to the hardware by, for example, um, checking the five qubit simulation as it is right now with a 20 qubit simulation in which we use the 15 other qubits to do um, error correction? It's an interesting question. I think probably, as you can see, we don't have enough qubits yet, right? So you can see, for example, the plot I'm showing right now, right? You're still in the regime where you add more qubits, you get way better performance um, to ah, do it. True. So I suspect That's that true. right now, it's more important to get more qubits. 
You're but right. I think that your idea probably would be correct soon, right? Because you can see we're probably getting closer to a plateau region. And then indeed it might be worthwhile if we talk about 50 qubit machines, once those become more widely available, that might indeed be something that one should think about doing. It's a good idea. Thank you very much. Thanks for the questions. So now the turn of Judita. Uh, hi, thank you very much for these lectures. It was really wonderful to listen to this. So uh, on the slide 25, uh, you kind of hinted uh, that uh, all these examples were shown for the data collected in a usual way. Uh, so for the classical computing. So I want to kind of ask you, uh, in what terms should we think in future the data should be collected? So uh, looking at uh, your conclusion and, and some, some of the performance, um, it seems that you uh, need less data to obtain the same result. Um, so does this hint that uh, for LHC, for example, we should have shorter specific runs? So so in maybe maybe you can give some hints on in which terms we should think for, for the sure. collecting. So I mean just to be clear, right? When we do our like state of the art classical machine learning algorithms, we typically use millions of events, right? Um, to get the ultimate performance. But of course, given quantum computers of today, we cannot do that. So the reason that most people here are using fewer events is not because they think that's better to do but rather because those are the limitations given the hardware, right? It would just take um, too long. So I think that before we can ask that question, right? We have to get further with quantum computers to actually ask, is that really the ultimate performance? Because I'd be kind of surprised, right? If, you know, a couple, a handful of events can really provide you with the same breadth as, as millions, because you can think about it, right? You might have a usual, unusual events that only happen every, you know, thousand events or things like that. You're simply missing them. And it doesn't matter how smart your algorithm is, it's not going to be able to do that. So I think, but your point is still good. And I think this is something that a number of people are thinking about, if this might be a way that we could train more quickly. And so what that's actually gaining us is not getting rid of data, but actually saving us CPU time in these various different trainings, because it means that when we need to train our algorithm or when we need to perform our analysis, we need to run over a fewer events and things like that. I suspect we're still going to need the same amount of data that we actually can have, because that always impacts your error on your measurement directly. Okay, yeah, thank you, thank you. Fun question, thanks. Okay, now I can see Giuseppe. Yes, uh, uh, thank you for uh, these very fascinating lectures. I have a question that's a bit perhaps off topic, but I wonder if you can, if you have any comments on the implication of quantum security for breaking cryptographic keys and the impact that it would have on finance, namely Bitcoin, the blockchain, and even online banking? Yeah, so it's a, it's a great question. Um, unfortunately, I'm not really an expert in this, in this field by any means. I, but from what I've read, and it's something we talked a bit about, I guess, probably yesterday or the day before, um, particularly when we look at these factoring algorithms, yes. I think it's clear that we should be deeply concerned that this is something that's going to happen. Uh, I think there's a very strong likelihood that this will happen, independent of whether we use quantum computers for other things. So if I was a policymaker, I would be trying to prepare in that direction already now, um, thinking that we really need to move towards um, different forms of encryption. The good news is, of course, there are actually quantum methods um, for um, encryption that would, of course, be protected. But at the same time, those are still research projects. And so I think it's really important that those progress as soon as possible, because that could allow us to be able to move towards new ways of protecting our information. But it's a good point. It's something we should be worried about. Thank you. Thanks. So now going to the chat. Uh, so from Andreas in page 15. So Heather, if you can look for that. 
he said that the plots look identical. What are the uncertainties on the data points? If it's smaller than the markers, then the plot line has very bad uh, G2. If larger and not plotted, then it's a huge coincidence that the plots look so similar. Yeah, so those are not really fits that we're showing. They're just trying to guide the eye um, to do it. And indeed, I don't think we're actually showing the error bars. Um, we did check, and they really aren't exactly identical. But on the whole, they really are um, quite compatible. One thing to know is that in order to obtain these plots, we did actually run multiple times, and then we averaged them um, to do the comparison. And so um, that's part of what's in. But I believe that we're not actually showing the error bars um, to do it. But we did check. They're not identical. But indeed, we don't see much difference between um, B wave and simulation. He replies, a still a streaking coincidence. Yes, um, when we first saw the results, we didn't believe them either. We said, you know, it can't be this similar. There must be a difference. And so that's why we went and we dug into it and we compared it. And indeed, they're very similar. I agree with you. We could have plotted that in a more straightforward way. Um, I think that's a good point. He said, thanks. <laughs> So then another one from Jason. A lot of time in HEP analysis is spent understanding, estimating, and propagating uncertainties. Does the quantum computing paradigm offer any efficiencies in this regard? Noted unfolding is sort of related to this. Yeah, so I didn't talk about it, but indeed there are a number of people thinking about how one might actually do unfolding on quantum computers. Um, I had a couple links um, near the end. And I think that's really interesting um, to, to think about. Unfortunately, I feel like a lot of the work we do in propagating uncertainties is very mechanical, right? It's you apply this uncertainty, you have to apply it to your events, you have to run it through you know, your reconstruction, you have to make your distribution. And to be honest, I feel like probably we could do that maybe better classically, but it's not something I've thought about so deeply. I haven't heard of anyone thinking about that on quantum computers. But it's an interesting point. You're right that we spend a lot of time in analysis doing that. It would be wonderful if we could do it a lot better. OK, so he says, thank you, Heather. So I don't see more questions in the chat, neither raise hands. So yeah, nothing popping up. So I think uh, no more questions for today. So well, thanks again, Heather. I think it was a very successful uh, lectures. And yeah, it was, I was getting a lot of compliments thanks to you. So <laughs> thank you very much because it well, was, in fact, they are saying thank you again. Great, serious, Heather. Thank you very much. So uh, it was a pleasure to go and, uh, with you. Well, thank you, Maria. Thanks for inviting me. It was it was fun to do it. And thank you to everybody for all the great questions. Um, I enjoyed the discussion a lot as well. Even they are asking if there will be a next one. OK. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so I think we can close this one. And yes, uh, have a nice week, evening, and everything. OK. Yeah, thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye.